Wayne, um, wow, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. And um, really saddened that we we can't all be at the uh, observatory tonight. That would have been awesome. But next time, uh, next year, next year, yeah, that's right. Um, looking forward to to catching up with yep. you all in, in person. Um, so yeah, here robotics has been around for um, five years now, which is kind of scary. We haven't been active the entire time, as Wayne said. Um, it was started when I was still during a PhD, which is a terrible idea. Um, and, and that's why a lot of work didn't get done um, over the, the, the first couple of years. It also started as an asteroid mining company. Um, kind of, it was, it was started after there was a, a wave of asteroid mining companies started in the US, um, all of whom have now, um, I guess, collapsed or, or don't really exist anymore or have been, you know, purchased for... Um, the, the IP that they created. Uh, so a little bit of a shame, but that's okay. Like those people are still in the ecosystem doing fantastic things. Um, and it, it helped us start this company, which was amazing as well. So we've done what's called a pivot since then. We've, we've transitioned a little bit. And um, yeah, I think it's really exciting what we're doing actually. Um, sadly, most of the exciting stuff has occurred during the pandemic. Um, so we, we haven't been able to talk about it as much as we would have, um, but it's also allowed us to focus. And I think um, a lot of people in the US and Europe are really uh, picking up on what we're doing here in Australia. And um, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's impactful, it's different, it's fresh, um, and it's a different way of, of thinking about things. And I think that's the real power that we have here in here in Australia and, and we should really continue to follow that. So um, good to see you all virtually. So the, what we do at here Robotics is in-orbit satellite inspection. Um, and we do that in a special way. Um, the title of this talk is Making Space Transparent. Um, Make Space Transparent is actually our motto at the company. It's, it's kind of like our big goal um, because space is transparent. <laughs> um, you, can, you can see through space but it's actually remarkably difficult to see features on other objects in space. And so solving that problem is, is really what our company is all about. And specifically, we do this visually um, and we call it an inspection. Um, but yeah, really, it's, it's picking up details on other objects that we care about. So we're calling this talk, How to Visually Inspect Satellites and Debris. So a little bit of a time, sorry. Yeah. Did someone have a question? Maybe I misheard. Um, I'll keep going. So a little bit of a timeline of the company. Um, the first idea actually came in 2015. And just like Chris Boschhausen, um, the idea was, uh, I guess, helped along by the Space Generation Advisory Council. Uh, so in 2015, I just wrote a paper. I really wanted to go to the uh, IAC that year. It was in Israel. I had no way to get there. Um, I saw that there was some money on offer from the SGAC. All I had to do was win, uh, write a winning paper um, about mitigating asteroid threats. Um, and so I did. There were, I think there were 50 entries. Um, my paper won. I think it's because, we'll, again, talking about Australians, I was able to think differently about the problem. Um, and a couple of Australians have actually won the prize after me as well. So I think that... that um, tradition and trend is continuing, which is fantastic. Um, after going to IAC, I thought everyone in the world wanted this idea to do with asteroids. Um, so I founded a company based on it. Um, then towards the right at the end of, of my PhD, um, the, the company went through UNSW founded 10X. So that's our startup program at UNSW. We then had our first major contract in 2020. We'd had some smaller contracts leading up to that. But 2020, um, we had massive contract from uh, defense that started literally the week that the, the first shutdowns began in Sydney. Um, so <laughs> terrible timing, um, but it allowed us to really focus hard on, on delivering great value to defense. Um, then we had a seed investment earlier this year um, from a wealthy individual that runs a uh, quant hedge funds in the UK, um, which is fantastic. One of the one of the billionaires from the UK. Um, we don't like 
talking about his billionaire status much because, you know, it's another billionaire investing in a space company, right? So, um, but yeah, we're really glad to have him, on, have, have him on board and he's quite a visionary, which is fantastic. Directly after we got the seed investment, we're actually accepted into the Y Combinator program. That's that giant orange Y that you see in the bottom right-hand corner. That's actually the premier um, startup accelerator in the world. Um, so I'm sure you've all heard of Airbnb. That's where they got their start through the same program. Um, and heaps of other companies that you know, um, infamously Momentus went through this program. Um, and, and now that some of the, the co-founders of Momentus or early team uh, have gone through the program again when we were there. Um, yeah, could I, yeah, yeah, nice one, Wayne. Uh, no, heaps of other great companies have been through Y Combinator as well, though. So Astranus, which is a, a company launching a bunch of geo satellites, the first which will be later this year, went through that company went through the accelerator and a bunch of, bunch of others as well. Um, it's a fantastic program. We were the only one of two Australian companies that went through um, during the middle of this year. It just finished up a couple of weeks ago. Um, so really uh, great program to go to. And it, it, it kind of opens uh, US investors' eyes um, to what people here in Australia are doing. So going through this program was really great for the company. We've also just opened a UK office um, and we, we'd love to just remain Australian, fully Australian, um, but it, it turns out that ESA's procurement rules require a, a uh, presence in, in Europe, and so we're, we're setting up there. Take from that comment what you will. Um, a little bit about the founders. Um, <laughs> this is an old photo. I, I'd say because of my academic roots, one thing that um, many of us academics here are guilty of is that we take a photo we don't like taking photos. So 10 years later, we'll have the same photo. Um, and not quite 10 years, but that's what's happened here. It's uh, three years ago, we took this photo. Um, I, I think I looked a bit more well-rested then and definitely had shorter hair. Um, but yeah, so Haranya, my co-founder, also has a PhD. He's in Metronics. Um, and now he's had three years at here um, and at UNSW as well, running engineering teams. Um, and really working hard with space supplies. It's actually really hard to buy things from space companies, um, which is really sad. I'm, I'm sure many of you have had the same experience. Um, myself, Astrodynamics um, PhD, as Wayne mentioned. Um, I've had a few years building and running teams um, before the PhD, as well as um, at here. And I've, I've made a lot of sales. I've become a sales guy, guys. Um, which is okay. We need sales guys as well, especially sales guys that know what they're talking about. They actually know the product uniquely. And I would encourage all of us to become sales guys in some capacity. Um, also negotiating those supply contracts with, uh, with suppliers and space supplies, notorious, as I said. These are just a handful of our customers. We've actually got um, around 10 customers right now, which is really exciting. Um, so we're working with the Department of Defense, uh, which is great. Working with the Air Force as well. They were actually our first customer, or our, our first um, customer buying a product related to our current business. And we're eternally grateful to them. Um, Spiral Blue and Space Machines Company, you guys might know, um, both, both are startups, both have most of their presence based here in Sydney, um, which is really fantastic. And we've, we've got a series of other customers as well. We're also working with Eva right now. So Eva just had a satellite launch, uh, which is fantastic. I'm sure you'll be talking about it more later. Um, and we'll see if we can get an image of that, where it's, it's proving difficult at this time. Um, so fingers crossed. So why, why, do, why do we do what we do? Um, primarily, we're looking at satellites and debris as well. And there's three core reasons. So the first is that the number of satellites is increasing rapidly. Um, so I do apologize for those who haven't seen a logarithmic chart before, but there was no better way to show the ridiculous um, growth in satellites that's occurring. Because otherwise it would look like a, you know, the line would be straight and then it would go up really rapidly at the end. Um, so that's kind of what's happening here. So the number of satellites is almost doubling, not quite doubling every year. 
um, at this point, which is insane. Uh, yeah, a lot of that is, um, I guess, the, the Starlink con constellation from SpaceX and the OneWeb constellation from OneWeb. Um, but in addition to that, there's a lot of other satellites um, going up, which is really amazing, really fantastic. And I think it's, it's what should be happening at this point. Um, that said, it's, that's not without risk. And we've got to really mitigate that risk um, as well. So really we're expecting um, at here, we expect around 100,000 satellites to be launched um, over the next 10 years. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of variations around the, the total number that people expect. Um, but the point is that the trend's there and it's going to be a large number. And um, it's really hard to predict um, because you can't, uh, you can't interpolate, you can only extrapolate. So it's really hard to figure out um, in which way that extrapolation will go exactly, but the number's going to be large um, and we've got to be ready for that. And the current infrastructure on, uh, on Earth can't track everything that's going up and ramp up in this time period. This is the second problem. Um, as you all know, space is hard. Um, so yeah, 40, roughly 40% 40 of um, satellites, this data was collected in 2018. And I think it went over five year, a five year period. So a lot of satellite missions are failed in um, at least a partial capacity. Um, and hey, it's not just the satellites, the CubeSats um, in low Earth orbit, it's also a quarter of geosynchronous satellites. Um, so you'll see a trend here. It's not, it's not these, these universities who are throwing up satellites um, and, and some of which don't work super well. It's everybody. Everyone's having failed satellites. Um, I can also tell you that um, the insurance companies, they don't really insure satellites in low Earth orbit. They have looked into the geosynchronous orbit satellites and inspection could have helped save half of those satellites that you see that have failed there. Um, so inspection is really important, it's really necessary, and it could really help save satellites and prevent them from becoming debris. Now, going back to what I said at the, the top of this slide, space is hard. I don't know if it's hard in, in that it's complex. We have heaps of really complex systems on Earth. It's just that we don't expect the systems on Earth to work first time either. It's just that we expect someone to be there, an engineer to be there, to have the system operate for um, several years and for them to be able to fix any problems that crop up. That doesn't occur with satellites at the moment. Um, and, and part of the answer to that is to, um, is to uh, maintain satellites and have on-orbit servicing. But the other part of that is to be able to have the sensors to see what's going on. And and, and it's not just sensors on board the satellite either, because if the satellite loses power, um, where are you going to get your information from? Um, and sometimes it's better to have remote sensors anyway. And we, so we think inspection is really important. Um, and it's, it's one of the, I guess, three pillars of what you should do um, for, I guess, best in class satellite missions. And this is the last problem slide. Um, that'll show up. And I alluded it to it earlier when I talked about um, making space transparent. Space is really big. It's ridiculously big. Uh, it's crazy. Um, so just low Earth orbit is over 500 billion cubic kilometers. And, you know, I could try and compare it to the oceans on Earth, but it would be pointless because that's so much more voluminous <laughs> than all of the oceans on Earth. The oceans of Earth are nothing compared to um, the volume of low Earth orbit. So it's bloody ginormous. And so we shouldn't feel bad that we can only see single pixels most of the time when we're looking up from Earth. Not all of the time, but a lot of the time. Um, yeah, it's really big. Just Definitely, let's, let's remember that as space people. Um, now, a lot of people talk about rendezvous inspection um, and that's not the approach that we take at HERA Robotics. So when we talk about rendezvous, we talk about taking months to match orbits with the object that we care about um, before we can inspect it. 
Um, it's usually, if it doesn't take months, it's usually cost prohibitive because um, you, you'd need to use a lot of fuel to get there. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes the um, orbits just don't line up and it's both, it takes a lot of time and it's cost prohibitive. Um, so that's a big no-no. Um, so to really solve this problem and to really get to any um, satellite or piece of debris to inspect it um, within, usually we use the Earth-Moon orbit, so anywhere between Earth and the Moon. So to do that, we, we do what we call flyby inspections. So that's where we get really close, um, sometimes as close as these rendezvous inspections, um, but we just continue to fly past. So this is really, this is just taking a leaf out of planetary exploration handbook. Um, so the majority of asteroids that we visited as a human species, um, some of the planets, Pluto is a, is a notable um, outstanding member of that club. Um, we've only seen via flyby and really, really, really fast flyby. So we go really close, really fast, but we have the right camera set up and we have the right um, software algorithms to take that data as we go really fast by. Um, and I can tell you right now, some of the um, satellites that we've collected images of when we're flying really fast by, sometimes it's, it's 15 kilometers per second. So if, you, if you've got one satellite coming this way at seven and a half kilometers per second, one going the other way at the same speed, um, the rel relative velocity is two, two times you know, the, the velocity of, of one or the other. So really, really fast. Um, often we get blurs. I'll actually show you a, a, a montage in the question slide of this presentation. Um, but then you can do really smart things with um, good software and then rebuild the image and get the information that you need out of it. So a little bit of a graphic there, but yeah, kind of, we need better graphics. Um, but yeah, they're going really fast. It's kind of like um, F1 photography, I guess. I don't know how else to describe it. It's really fast, but you can still get a lot of data. We believe we can collect 80 to 90% of the same kind of data that you could get from what we call a rendezvous um, inspection. So that's how we solve this problem at HERO Robotics. Um, and this is our product, HERO Inspect. Um, so this is one of the images that we've taken earlier this year. Um, of the International Space Station. Each pixel that you see there is about 10 centimeters. Um, and you can really see what the heck's happening on the ISF at this time. So the Crew-1 Dragon is there. I do apologize for the, the font size, by the way. Um, hopefully you can see it though. Crew-1 Dragon's there. Um, you can see some of the um, structure of the, um, of the solar panels. Um, the solar panels have been upgraded since, since this time. Uh, but at this time, they were just the old solar panels. Some are on their sides, so they're at 90 degrees to the camera, while others are, are kind of full facing the camera. So we've been doing this since May 2020. And I can tell you that we are the only commercial company um, that you can buy this service from at the moment, uh, which is kind of crazy to think about. That's in the whole world. Um, we have competitors that are uh, coming. They're still coming. And it's taking them a long time because they're really thinking that rendezvous inspection method is the one that will win. Um, but it means that they take a long time to get to market. Um, and we're just there uh, taking images in the meantime. Um, what we've done so far is provided data such as identity. So we've literally identified um, a space object that wasn't identified before. And we've done that with the US Space Force. So they didn't even know what it was. <laughs> um, but we took a photo of it, then we were able to verify what it was based on um, what should have launched on that on the launch that it was associated with. Um, we can understand things like power, power metrics, how much power is it taking up, um, damage, um, attitude, orientation. Uh, we think we should be able to understand spin rate. We haven't been able to fig figure that one out quite yet. We, we think we'll need multiple images to do that. Um, but all sorts of information like that. Uh, CubeSats, <laughs> CubeSats really tough. We've taken images of CubeSats, but they've been quite small images so far. Um, so as I said, working with Ada's team on that so far and uh, right now, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll collect those images soon. Um, we have access to 25 satellites right now. Now, 
important to note, we do not own these satellites. Other people own these satellites. But, and these are all Earth observation satellites as well. So we use 25 Earth observation satellites to do what we do. Um, and we don't own any of them. The thing is, none of these satellites are used over the ocean because they're Earth observation satellites, right? Not ocean observation satellites. So, and, and that's most of the time. That's like two thirds of the time, right? And then um, there's some time kind of when it's dark on Earth, um, but it's not dark in space. Um, so we can use them kind of when um, the satellites are going into darkness or out of darkness as well. So we can increase at the moment, most Earth, Earth observation satellites are used for 15% of the time. We can increase that to 60% of the time. Um, potentially doing what we do. So we can give these guys money they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, so it's great for them. And it's great for us because we don't need to build a whole spacecraft and go through all that heartache um, if, if it doesn't work. And as you saw in the, uh, one of the images earlier, a lot of, a lot of satellites don't work. Um, so it's a normal thing. It's nothing to be sad about. It's just that a, a small company like us just can't have a failure um, because it would destroy our company. So it's great working with these other partners. Some of the satellites we're using are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so a lot of great hardware um, and we're, we're able to use them in a safe way and, and collect this kind of data that no one else um, is, is collecting right now. I should mention that you can't just get a satellite and point and shoot. So first off, the majority of satellites just don't work doing this. They've got some design we call them floor, but you know, some design function that prevents them from doing this. Um, and it takes a lot of work to figure out what the right settings are. Um, once you get the data, what to do with it, et cetera, to make this work. So it's really hard to do. Uh, we figured it out on a few satellites, which is good, um, but we're always learning and, and trying to do more stuff. So you can't copy this straight away, but um, if you can make it work, it's, it's really great. And these are some of the images that you can get. So this is a, um, a rocket body, it's an upper stage. Um, what was interesting about this image is that we took it about a week after launch and it's roughly twice as big as, um, as the US Space Force thought. So it was, it was launched by another, company, uh, another country. Um, they thought they knew what rocket it was launching with, um, but yeah, it's about twice the length. Um, which means that whatever was launched on it was probably, was a lot bigger than they thought as well. <laughs> we, we don't have an image of that to show, show with you tonight, sadly. Um, but it's really interesting. Um, so yeah, first off, understanding size is important. Um, it's not something you can necessarily do with radar. So radar gets the radar cross-section area, which doesn't necessarily match with the actual area um, optical is pretty good at getting what the actual area is. So we're pretty confident we've got the right size here. Um, what you can't tell from this image is exactly how long the rocket is. So we know kind of the lower bound, um, but it might kind of be on its side such that we don't quite see how long it is. So you'd want to probably take some more images and, and double check with that before you know exactly how big something is. You can start to bound things like the, the size and and the mass and things like that. Um, so yeah, this is this is one example. I think this was 130 kilometers away from our sensors. So you can see, because our sensors are so powerful and they're, they're you know, like five, six, 700 kilometers or whatever, and looking down at Earth and getting really good images of Earth. The other thing is the things we're looking at are a lot, lot closer. So because they're so much closer, you actually get better resolution than these things are rated for, for the ground, which is really exciting as well, because um, if you're looking at some of the smaller spacecraft, you want to pick out, you know, the little antenna on the side or, you know, the, the small solar panel um, that no one knows about. I should also mention that the size thing isn't exclusive to this image. We've actually taken a number of images where the sizes aren't what you read online. And sometimes, the companies involved also don't know. Um, so that, that happens as well. Um, sometimes it's not exactly clear to the designers what actually happened when the satellite was being put together. And so what you see on orbit is different to what you see in the blueprint, which is normal for things that we construct on Earth. 
which is why we have you know surveyors that go out there and see what's actually there. Um, we don't expect it for space, but it does happen there as well. Okay, so moving on. <clears throat> um, this is um, what we have right now and what we also plan for our sensor network. Um, so at the moment we use repurposed Earth observation satellites. Um, everything in blue is what we operate today. So we've got satellites between um, 450 and 700 kilometers that we use uh, and 25 of those, as I said. Um, as time goes on, we're gonna have hosted payload cameras. So these are under construction right now in Canberra. Um, sadly, we couldn't have them built in New South Wales, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll get there. Um, and the point of those is that um, sometimes uh, satellites that would be perfectly good for us to use just don't have a camera on board. Um, so if we can supply those, then we can um, turn those. Otherwise, um, you know, spacecraft that might become space debris because they've run out of useful life, we can give them a second life and reduce debris in that way as well. Um, so that's something else we're doing. The last thing we're doing is looking at maneuverable cameras. So really, um, to fill a volume, you don't, I guess you, you don't want to fill it with heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of satellites like you would when you're, you're trying to fill a surface area. So when you're doing an Earth observation um, constellation, looking at the Earth, you just add, add um, sensors or satellites until you fill all of the area that you want within a certain time frame. Um, of course, SpaceX is going to the next level on OneWeb as well. They're saying, okay, we need every bit of Earth covered all the time. Um, and then when you turn that into a volume, then you need to multiply that number of satellites again. So that's not okay. We're not in that business. Um, and the last way that we can really um, make the sensors that we have up there efficient is by slightly modifying their trajectories. Um, and that's what we mean by maneuverable cameras. So we're not there yet. Um, we're working with uh, Australian Defence Force and a few others um, to make this happen. But yeah, maneuverable cameras will be the, I guess, the final stage of what we do. Um, oh, and talking of uh, the maneuverable cameras, this is really, really rudimentary. I almost apologize for this image. Um, and it, again, terrible font. Um, this, I just wanted to show you what we're doing with um, Australian Space Force. Um, so they've, they've got satellites in, in geo and they want to know what's happening with them sometimes. And sometimes other satellites come by and they'd like to know what those satellites are doing as well. So um, we have a concept, it's called the Orbital Flow Net. Um, we've also already been through a few designs. Um, the idea is that it's a decentralized network of satellites around geo and you can get to anywhere in geo within 24 hours. Uh, which is really powerful. So that's using those maneuverable cameras. So as soon as you can maneuver, you can start to do interesting things by getting to places um, that would otherwise, you know, take you a really long time to get to. So yeah, again, apologies for the terrible image. We can talk about that more. Um, I see some questions are popping up in the chat, so I might answer those, those last because it's hard to um, look at both at the same time. Uh, so these again are terrible images, but they, you know, they're what I could come up with at the last minute. Um, so on the left is um, our home's imaging system. For a short time, it was called the Potteroo, but that is not the name anymore. It's the home's imaging system. We just like the name better. Um, hey, Potteroo is a great Australian animal, but home's is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it just looks like a, it almost looks like a CubeSat, except it doesn't leave the spacecraft platform. It's just meant to stick on there. And the spacecraft platform maneuvers and then um, gets in the right orientation to take a photo. Um, on the right-hand side is the Space Machines Company um, spacecraft. Actually, don't know what it's called right now. Um, might have changed names a couple of times, so I just don't call it out. Um, but it's the Space Machines Company spacecraft um, and pretty much every one of their spacecraft that they want, we want to stick one of these homes images on. Um, and, and really we want to start giving these free to 
as many people as we can, especially um, space tug um, companies, because usually with their mission, um, they use them for two to four weeks and then they're done with them. And then there's a perfectly good satellite orbiting the earth doing nothing. Um, so we'd like to keep them useful and have cameras on board um, so we can do really useful things with them and get to those tricky orbits in high LEO um, and elsewhere to really get good coverage for our customers. Um, so yeah, as I said, we give them free to people launching space platforms and then we treat them like any one of our other suppliers. So we pay them for every image that we collect, uh, which is really cool. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's a bit of a transition to some of these people. They're like, what did you pay up from? We're like, you'll get more money if we, and money you wouldn't otherwise get um, if we pay you the other way. Anyway, it's a bit of a teaching experience slash learning experience, but uh, yeah, we're getting there. Um, so that, that's all for the uh, space debris stuff. As I said, we were originally interested in asteroids and hey, we're still going there because asteroids are just, just another object. Um, and a lot of them pass through the Earth Moon system. And our way of doing things, because we designed it originally for asteroids, it happens to be very good at looking at asteroids still as well with the maneuverable camera concept. Um, and this is a little bit of the of what we see here. So humanity is imaged, I think we're up to 14 or maybe fifth, I think we're up to 15 now, 15 asteroids that we've imaged. Um, and we know that there's at least 50 asteroid types out there. So we're only just scratching the surface and you need to go into at least all the different asteroid types um, to really start developing a good picture of, of the mineralogy of the uh, solar system essentially. So we think probably 100 asteroids is a good number and you don't have to go to the asteroids to see these either. So you can just wait for them to fly through the Earth moon system. Um, and once you have a good concept of which kind of, I guess, color belongs to which asteroid type, then you can start linking them to meteors um, that have already fallen to Earth and start to get a good picture of the mineralogy. Um, so making these missions really cheap was critical to us. Um, and with the uh, geo concept that we showed you earlier, those same maneuverable spacecraft with cameras would be just as good as visiting a subset of these asteroids that pass through the Earth moon system every year. All you have to do is wait for the right asteroid with the right parameters to come close um, and then zip out to visit it and, and do one of those flyby inspection missions just as it comes through the Earth moon system. Um, so it makes asteroid missions really cheap. Um, by really cheap, we mean we think it will cost about a million dollars US, um, but that's substantially lower than asteroid missions that have flown before. And this is a little bit about how it works. So you've got, <clears throat> we call it the Hero Orbit, um, all these little satellites we're just calling Hero. Um, we thought it was cute at the time. And they're just above Geo, and then you wait for one of these asteroids to pass through the Earth Moon system. And then you, you fly out on a little um, ellipsoidal uh, orbit and then meet it at the, the point where the asteroid passes through your orbital plane um, and get that information that you wouldn't be able to get before. Again, just like the rest of our um, concept, it's just really efficient, really scalable, cuts costs, and you can do it really quickly as well. So you don't need 10 years to plan a mission anymore. It's like stick some cameras up there, um, and now they're cheap enough that you can just wait until the right asteroid comes to you. Um, so it's just a different way of thinking about how this is done. I think the other cool thing is um, the heterogeneity, which just means if two or three different countries want to launch their own satellites and contribute to um, a decentralized kind of constellation, each of them waiting for the right asteroid to come by, um, you can do that. And so it's a really good way to collaborate with different nations that might want to build their own space hardware to, to look at these asteroids. So that's, that's it, guys. Like, really appreciate your time. Um, happy to answer any questions. Janine, I think I saw you, you came up with a couple, so we'll definitely get through those. And um, yeah, as I promised, this is a question slide. And this is one of the images that we took. So it shows you the different um, I guess processes. So originally it's a smudge like this, and we pick out where it is, and we see the smudge, then we um, yeah, get a sharp image from it. 
and then we color it so you can highlight different parts of the space station and then you can label it just by matching what should be on the space station compared to what you see. If something doesn't match, uh, which quite often happens, that means something has changed in actuality, which um, sometimes the operators aren't even aware of. Um, so yeah, it happens. Stuff in space is often different to what we think it is here on Earth. Cool. Um, Wayne, should I just answer some of these Ed, questions or would you mind reading yeah, those out? Thanks very much, Stu. I'll just go through Q&A now and we'll uh, most likely by the time you've answered all, all that's currently, you may have some extras on top of that. So feel free, we've got plenty. Okay. Of would, would you mind reading those out? I just, um, okay. just with my, yeah. Thank no you. worries, yeah, that's probably because you've got too many uh, things on. Too many screens, yeah. Yeah, I'll just go back to um, Janine's, okay. One specifically about this. Yeah, I know it's not sort of that. Uh, yeah, I was asking about the, the, the coloration it had to do with the, the temperature, but I see in this case you've just used it to differentiate. You haven't got any yeah. temperature. Yeah, difference. it's weird though, because it kind of, yeah, the coloration happens to line up with the radiators. Um, so yeah, it looks like it's uh, infrared. But I think, actually, I think this was taken in red band then. So normally we just get one color for the whole spacecraft, you know, where, yeah, just, just the way our system works, we can't choose the color normally. Um, but yeah, it is showing in the red here, but I also note that the radiators are also painted white. So in most colors, you would expect them to be very bright. That's why I wondered whether it might've been temperature because um, yeah. yeah, there's are going to be a different temperature to the, the others because it's exhausting, but that was still- No, fair point. enough. I, I just thought about what your objects were and that's fine. Um, I think that other booster that you were talking about earlier, I was just wondering mm -hmm. whether that might've been one of the Chinese boosters that we've been set up recently because it was a couple of launches and they'd, they failed, but I suppose Defence doesn't want to tell you exactly why they were looking at those objects, but I do recall that uh, the two launches that they had in the last 10 days or something, um, they might be interested in what they were putting up because I believe that they were both spy satellites. So yes, um, yes. They it's might very be, interesting they what goes on. Idea where they were, were well, they they said unfortunately neither of them was successful, which I'm assuming means there was some problem yeah. with the payload or something like that. So it's oh, not definitely like government government built satellites fail as well, and we've yeah, it yeah we've seen that on orbit. So that's right. Um, and Janine was talking about what kind of light cameras capture. Yeah, you're only really, there's, there's nothing special with these cameras. They're only just visual cameras. There's no infrared or uh, ultraviolet or what type of things are there? Is, there is infrared on most of these. Right. So there's IR. So that's there is IR. Saying. But as I said, like we don't choose which band we get them in. Sometimes, sometimes we'll get a satellite, like we'll, Every time we take an image, we, we take like 30. So we might get a satellite in a few of the bands, which is great. Um, but yeah, you can't, you can't pick it, sadly. It's a bit more random. One day we will be able to, but not today. Well, I'm assuming that's got something to do with also the, the, the who's carrying these cameras that you're actually imaging mm. at this stage. It sounds like you've yeah. obviously got some target cameras that you want people to, to take up. If they'll yes. Do yeah, because then we, then we can control it. Better, yeah, yeah, for sure. But in some yeah. cases, you've probably got some people initially for the when you started doing the work that you didn't have a lot of control over. That was just what they had. It was yeah. close enough to what you wanted, and it, it allows you to be able to at least start, oh, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, no, it's um, yeah, I don't know if anyone's seen our original images, which I haven't shared here because they're, they're kind of crap. Um, but although they're better than anyone could do commercially at the time, because no one else was doing it commercially. Um, yeah, there, there are not all space cameras are created equal. That's for sure. I've got a couple of interesting questions just copped up while I've been, we've been talking. <coughs> Marshall's asked, if you, if you were using other people's satellites, is there an issue with the content of the images you take, e national mm. security matters slash secrecy, mm. and hence confidence in the security of the company that owns the satellite? Yes. Yes and yes, there is. Um, so we, yeah, we're very careful about partners that we select to work with. Um, they're always from, I guess, they're always trusted partners. 
Um, and we always um, have a very rigorous process, which is very painful, um, but it works um, to, to contract and make sure that both we and they are protected as well um, and to make sure they can comply with their national security laws. Um, but yeah, yep, we're, we're very rigorous in this country though, which is good. We've got the Defense Export Control Office and they're doing a great job trying to keep us safe, but allow industry to function at the same time. Mm. Uh, next one is Ava and Anne's, Ken's posed a question. Can you say more about what a maneuverable camera is, Will? Oh, yeah, 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 no, yes, I can. Um, thanks for asking, really appreciate that. It is just a, um, a satellite, presumably one that you own or one that you have control of that has a thruster and you're literally just maneuvering it. And the way that we're thinking about it is that it can happen in a few different ways. It doesn't need to be a massive maneuver. So just a phasing maneuver um, that allows you to get to a certain point of your orbit at a certain time. Um, already that can cut the, the amount of time that it takes for you to image an object by days. Um, so that's something really impactful straight away. It doesn't use a lot of fuel. And it goes as far as, um, as you saw in those asteroid missions, they require quite a bit more delta V. Um, so as time goes on, we would expect uh, small satellites to become more capable in terms of um, their thrusting capabilities and to be able to do larger and larger delta V maneuvers in a shorter period of time, um, but still get a lot of efficiency. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I mean. And um, the capability increase that you get is large. So I should also mention that um, SpaceX are already doing this. So they're already using a decentralized network to run their, their Starlink satellites. I can tell you right now, they're very hard to image because they thrust just a little bit out of your image frame, <laughs> which is really annoying sometimes. Um, but yeah, they're, um, they're already doing this. And I should note that the operators on the ground don't know what the heck they're doing next. So they don't have... Um, I guess, forward simulation capability to understand, and they, they can't because the computation would be ridiculous, to understand where each individual node is going. Um, and it, yeah, it's that they're, they're kind of solving a, um, I guess, they're, yeah, they're just doing micro optimizations all the time with really low thrust um, satellites. So it's really interesting. This is happening already. We already have swarms in orbit um, and, and SpaceX is, just one of the companies using swarm-like behavior um, in space right now. Makes traffic management really hard. Yes, it's gonna be something that's gonna happen in the future to, to yeah. manage. Uh, Scott's got an interesting question on asteroids. Is intercepting an asteroid as easy as you imply? Are most satellites- No. Are in the solar, <laughs> yeah. solar, solar plane and hence easy to intercept on an energy cost fuel use basis. Yep. I think that's, you might have answered that already, but just. No, no, I, th I think this is a good one to revisit though. So I should, all, I should note straight up that the asteroids that come through the Earth moon system are no more difficult to visit than the ones that we've already visited. And I think we claim that, yeah, so just because an asteroid is in the same plane as us, doesn't mean the trajectory that we can take to visit it um, will line up with it. Because yeah, there's in-plane maneuvers, which you've heard are very expensive, but there's also angular change maneuvers, which are also really expensive. So sometimes some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, asteroids that we've flown past are at 20 kilometers per second, which is even faster than we have um, image other satellites going around Earth. So they're really flying past really fast. Um, and I mean, Pluto is another great example. Like I think the, I can't remember what the relative velocity was, but it was massive as well. Um, so these are already extremely difficult targets to visit. And this is a much smaller problem because the um, time taken to maneuver is less, the distance is less, the error can't propagate for as long. Um, so there's actually, I think this is probably an easier problem than most current asteroid missions. Um, and, and yeah, I think it's, it's probably a fallacy to think that asteroid missions are easier because they're in the same plane. Um, they're not still a lot of issues involved.
but yeah, it's it's not easy though. That said, it's still hard. Continuing went on the asteroid theme, uh, Marcus Killian's got a question. In the long run, what what would the mechanism look like to catch a small asteroid or piece oh. of debris? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's hard. <laughs> no, that, that's hard. And, and I should also note that um, what I've suggested here is only good for prospecting the asteroids initially. Going, and, and there's, there's just no information about them so far, so we need to create that information. The next step is really hard with asteroids. And really what you're doing is you're looking out for targets of opportunity. So you're looking out for those asteroids with just the right dynamics that you have, you do have a very low delta V um, when you meet them at the at the right location. So yeah, it's really tough. Um, actually, another issue that we're seeing on asteroids, which we also see on space debris, um, and especially for active debris removal missions. And something that we're um, starting to help with, hopefully I'll be able to announce more soon, um, but it's really understanding the rotation um, axis and the rotational velocity um, of the asteroids or the debris. So it's not something that you can look up from Earth and understand what it is. You have to be a lot closer and um, start to see movement of different features on the surface of the body. Um, and, and yeah, as I said, that's, that's a problem that we've been told about multiple times um, and we're, we're starting to work with people to, to see how we might solve it. Um, yeah, big issue. Yes, I think in terms of wanting to try and capture part of it, you'd be looking at certain types of asteroids which have got valuable materials like nickel on them and things like that. And maybe even iron that um, uh, obviously they'd be worth trying trying to c capture pieces of those was there then mm. trying to an estimate as to how valuable they would be. But we're, we're still far too early days now to, to really even try to develop that type of stuff. Yeah. A couple of times, like even NASA has obviously been developing comet catching things where they've been trying to scoop yeah. up pieces. And that's that's still, even, even then, they had some issues mm. trying to even do all that. So... We're still really in early days in terms of the technology being widespread in terms of who can apply. Yeah, yeah I, I would say though, we're, we're probably being a bit more romantic and precious than we need to be about um, asteroid mining. So, I mean, the cheapest asteroid mining <laughs> that I know of is uh, was done by the, the Japanese um, and they literally got some aerogel and they stuck it on the outside of the ISS and let the little particles hit um, the aerogel and then they were able to um, collect some of those samples after they came back to Earth. So that was very cheap. The mass to orbit was low. I'm sure they stuck it on someone else's um, mass budget who didn't quite need it. And um, yeah, I got a really cheap sample back. So that's the cheapest asteroid mining I've heard of. And I'm sure there's um, some great scalable methods as well that we haven't, we haven't kind of let our minds think of yet. All right, we've got three more questions, and we'll just see at this point after we get the three whether we almost have finished the questions. Uh, Janine's got a question here. Is quantum computing making it easier and cheaper for you to do the calculations? Uh, and you and, and fellow swarm collaborators using that type of tech? Quantum computing. Sadly, no. I wish. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, so uh, you would be able to do a decent simulation, but it wouldn't necessarily match reality any better than I guess the classical methods that we have available to us but sadly no the quantum's not helping I wish that'd be amazing yeah, so we're not quite there yet okay uh, Eva and Anne's got a question now what sort of change in radial distances are you envisaging the hero satellite to move when rendezvousing with an asteroid a few earth radii or are we talking about tens oh. or even more no <laughs> less 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 okay um not much. It is. Oh, yeah. No, guys, the I guess what's changed recently is the amazing smorgasbord of asteroids that are coming really close, like crazy close to Earth. I'm talking closer than the moon. So these, this year, there's already, um, I think, just under 100 that are coming within that distance. And the radial um, change in distance. Um, so we did this work a couple of years ago. Um, and there were five asteroids that came in, I think it was 2018, that were 
in exactly the sweet spot um, were discovered long enough before they came flying through, um, had all the right characteristics. Yeah, so there are already five of those. Um, and if you, if you have a mission, so if you have a, I guess a swarm of satellites that are staying kind of out there for, for 10 years, then you'll, you'll see at least 50 of these things that you could, you could insert. So it is crazy. And the radial distance I should add is, is um, no more than um, a few thousand kilometers as well. Like it is almost nothing. And because you're starting out geo, the delta V is almost nothing to go a few thousand kilometers in height because it's an elliptical orbit as well. So I think um, I got I got lucky when I first did this paper in 2015. The data wasn't quite there yet. There weren't many asteroids coming this close. Um, but as time went on, the number of asteroids that we were discovering just exploded. And really what's even going to change the game again. So we're going to get a 10x increase in the asteroid discoveries from that um, southern telescope that's going up. I can't remember when it's, maybe someone else can answer this. I can't remember when it's going to be commissioned, but the um, the Southern um, Observatory that's going up in, in Chile, I think, will just, yeah, the LSST, it's going to discover like 10 times more asteroids. So um, it's going to be real smorgasbord. Wait for the asteroids come to us. Um, it's going to be great. Mm, okay. We've got one from Scott now. Uh, are you implying that you are or could be working with various defense departments that want to use laser, et cetera, et cetera to slow down and deorbit space. Oh, listen, this is a no. No, that's sorry, not sorry, not implying that. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be cool. <laughs> but no. I think I think the um, laser technology is still a little bit um, further out. Um, mm -hmm. But we're we're definitely working with active debris removal. Um, and they they usually they're actually usually not defense. They're usually um, for a variety of reasons, which we shouldn't go into here, um, but they're usually uh, commercial companies that are doing this. Um, sometimes the, uh, the relevant um, government body is, is paying for that original work, but it's usually um, private companies. Yeah, I, th I think that that's still in, in its infancy in terms of, getting the right type of technology because lasers do yeah. a lot of energy and um, to power yeah. over an extended period of time is, well, they're going to have to have a bit of power to do that. It's all right to just do a one-off yeah. test, but to keep it up there for a while and justify why it's going to be shooting things down, so to speak. Yeah. But I really... And I, I like something else we should keep in mind, um, Wayne, and, and for everyone here is anytime we illuminate anything in space, it's really really energy intensive um so yeah it's really hard to do a lot of these these technologies radar is another good one where um like the the u.s space force is radaring satellites in geo and, and getting interesting results back um, but again extremely um energy intensive and yeah there's a reason the government's the only one doing that kind of thing okay I've got two other questions, which I will mention in a few minutes after we finish the talk. Is there anything else related to the talk directly before I just um, thanks everyone to put their hands together and say thanks very much to Will before we stop the stop the record? Or are we done? Looks like we have done then, if that's the case. Oh, okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate the time tonight.